Hello, everybody, and welcome to the uh, podcast with Jeff, Steve, and our uh, special guest uh, today is Dr. Jenna Machoki. Uh, Dr. Jenna, it's lovely to have you with us. Um, Dr. Jenna, would you like to let our guests know just a little bit about yourself, who you are, what your speciality is? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's happy to be here. Um, as you said, I'm Dr. Jenna Machoki. I'm an immunologist, so that's someone who studies the immune system. Uh, I'm also an author. Uh, I'm a lecturer at university. Uh, I love talking about science, communicating science. Uh, I'm also a personal trainer, uh, fitness instructor, and uh, mother to to eight year old twins here in the UK. Wow. <laughs> it's well, and it's kind of funny. I didn't because... read that in a bio. Well, I didn't know I you were did. a personal trainer. Well, I love this because, miss that. because love I'm, it. I'm reading the bio and I'm going, you know, this is quite interesting. So, the, the, I mean, your bio is fantastic. Yeah. So um, specializing in understanding how nutrition, movement and lifestyle interacts with the immune system, health and disease. 20 years of experience um, and on a mission to break down the science behind our health and share scientifically proven secrets for being well good. Um, based in Brighton, uh, uh, author of two books, um, which is um, Immunity, The Science of Staying Well, um, and also Your Blueprint for a Strong Immunity, Mother of Twins, Home Cook, um, uh, also obviously a, 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 a fitness instructor as well to personal training. What, what, what's your qualifications there, Dr. Jenna? Yeah, that was, I actually trained in Switzerland. I was living there for eight years and I had a kind of, uh, I had my twins and I was like, I don't know if I want to go back and do the job I was doing before. So there I went ahead and trained and I mostly focused on pre and postnatal fitness. I think that was probably because my own experience at that time, having just given birth to twins. Wow. Um, so here in the UK, I don't currently do any active training with people, but I do work with trainers myself. I love anything with sports and fitness and exercise. So really passionate about that. And as I'm reading through, and obviously you have Scottish roots as, as well too. And as I'm reading through this, I'm like, oh my gosh, this, this Scottish. Is, I've got so it. much in common. Yeah. Because the one thing I actually do have in common is yeah. that I've got Scottish roots as well too. Yeah. But everything else, you're absolutely yeah. putting me to show. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but uh, that, that's absolutely amazing. Obviously, you've got a very uh, a varied background in the health space. So how is it? Um, that you become so passionate, obviously incredibly qualified as well too, around immunity. And um, I just noticed of interest as well too that your books came out. You were probably writing them before, obviously, the the big COVID um, came out, but the the interest in the immunity space is is absolutely skyrocketed mm. during this period as well too. But but where did your your passion come for the immune system and immunity and health and wellness? Do you know what? Uh, I, I grew up on a tiny farm in Scotland and I think on a farm you you kind of get to see the circle of life and um, you also kind of have that uh, uh, link between where your food is grown and how it gets on your plate. My mum worked in, in food and catering so I kind of absorbed those cooking skills from her and I just had this fascination with like why people got sick and what made us healthy. And my my mum was very much a believer of things could be solved at the dinner table and like good food was was really the sort of foundation of, of health. And so I didn't really have any specific career guidance that took me down this track, but I kind of just followed my nose and it led me into this field of immunology. And I just really fell in love with it. And, you know, this was obviously uh, several decades ago. And I just um, find that there's always something new to learn. And immunology is kind of a, a, a science that's branched off of microbiology. So studying microbes, which is much uh, older and uh, more well-established side. Um, whereas immunology is newer and it's evolved from thinking about how we fight off infections. You know, if you're missing a bit of your immune system, you're more susceptible to infections. And that's how we sort of discovered all these different parts of our immune system. But then I realized that there was so much more to it than that. And it kind of does it a disservice to just think of it as something that helps us fight infection. Um, and the inflammatory response by our immune system is is really interesting to me. I think that, you know, now we live at a time where non-infectious diseases are causing more poor health than infectious diseases, particularly in some parts of the world. So we have this problem where we're getting 
this inflammatory response by our immune system being triggered uh, in a sort of unwarranted fashion and it's leading us to all the kind of health crisis that we see today, you know, everything from cardiovascular disease, even mental health, um, autoimmunity, allergies. And to me, that really grabbed me as being much more uh, interesting and needing our attention at a certain point. And that's when I started writing the first book. Uh, it, Unfortunately, the publication date was the same time as the first lockdown here in the UK. So yeah, all everyone cared about was viruses. And what? here was me going, well, what about the non-infectious diseases? So it was a bit of a strange time, but it's definitely got people talking about their immune system. So that's, you know, been one outcome of the pandemic, that there there is much more kind of awareness, understanding, communication, the, the research community globally has you know contributed a lot um over the past few years because of the covid situation that's incredible i mean you, you mentioned like i've got points i want to bring up with you but you've brought up one that's even more interesting than those points that i want to bring up with you was inflammation as being a, a, a you know like it's a necessary response by the body but too much inflammation and the wrong immunity. I mean, when I was 20, I suffered with an arthritis in my spine, ankylosing spondylitis. The listeners know that. So, you know, I'm very familiar with autoimmune diseases intimately. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've, I've licked that disease. So I'm physically fine at 54. But, but you know, you, you've mentioned this, this, this chronic inflammation that, that, you know, you mentioned in your books and that. Which, which I'm fascinated about. I remember I really wanted even to study further in the role of CRP, an inflammatory marker in the body, and how it relates to heart disease, which was so overlooked for many, many years that the immune system is intimately linked with cardiovascular disease. I mean, that's an incredible link. And, you know, I'd love you if you could sort of talk a bit more about that to our listeners, because I think that's, you know, that's, that's our big, biggest killer in Australia is cardiovascular disease. And yeah, the immune system got a lot to do with it. I think it's still the biggest killer worldwide mm. um, is, is cardiovascular disease. And, and it's yet, like you say, it's only more recently that the inflammatory component has been recognized. Um, and so there's many reasons that we could see this unwanted inflammation rising in a person. And, and again, it's that sort of low grade chronic inflammation. But if you imagine if you've sort of got cut your cut your hand you will get an inflammatory response, an acute localized inflammatory response there. You get redness and swelling and the blood vessels in that area are going to be affected. They um, are going to try and entice those immune cells out of the blood into the tissue to, to repair the damage. So the blood vessels are getting more sticky. There's more um, uh, a sort of thickening of the blood to try and help stem any infection and, and part of the whole healing process. And then if we think about that in terms of uh, cardiovascular disease, when we have inflammation in the body, it's going to make those blood vessels more more sticky. It's going to thicken the blood. It's 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 trying to heal and repair as if you have a wound, but it's happening at this sort of low grade systemic level. Um, and then it's going to be aggravated by some of the other uh, uh, risk factors for cardiovascular disease that we see. So inactivity and and smoking and and um, uh, looking at um, the, the lipids uh, profile and that kind of thing too is going to exacerbate this inflammation which is kind of at the core of it and I think we struggle to find a, a condition that doesn't have inflammation involved mm. at some level mm. I certainly like for, for that to be the challenge yes. <laughs> so we find me a I asked my students that once what's a non-inflammatory disease chronic disease someone come up with a broken leg and I said no there's inflammation there yeah they couldn't they couldn't come up with one and it, I couldn't. It's, it's funny. Do you remember the article in Time magazine? Gosh, I must be going back about 15 years ago. Oh, I yeah. had it on the front of the cover that it was um, inflammation was the... Um, Fire. It was, it, yeah. they called it, and they also called it inflammaging, I think, was yeah, one yeah. article too. And, 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 and I think this is where they're really coming out saying that, you know, all ageing is, is inflammation. Yeah. At least related. But, but in terms of your understanding, maybe some of your epiphanies um, and, and what the public doesn't know around inflammation. You said before, and I don't want to lead you, but um, obviously Hippocrates, father of modern medicine, Steve and I are huge fans that, you know, that, that um, you know, that, that let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. But in terms of your understanding, because you did mention that before, obviously, that your mum said mm. that a lot of things can be solved at the kitchen table um, or, or at the dining table, I should say. What, what, are, what are your... Um, ideas around inflammation why do you think it's it's 
occurring so much? What, why do you think, what is it that we're doing uh, and what is it that people need to stop doing or start doing? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's kind of the crux of it, isn't it? And I think we know that we have this problem with this kind of low grade inflammation that's it's not there to serve a purpose it's not fighting an infection um, and doing its job it's just there all the time causing havoc and, and leading to these um health issues so we have to ask where is the inflammation coming from and i wouldn't say that there's one single thing that's causing it so it, we can look at all the various different factors and um, the gut is um a potential source of inflammation because the gut is home to a huge number of microbes. Those are our microbiota, the healthy microbes that do a lot of essential jobs for us, but they also them microbial components that our immune system is uh, is got receptors on to detect. So while they're in the lumen of the gut uh, and they're contained there, and the gut barrier is in a good condition, you have that separation, they shouldn't be causing any problem. But the minute you have any issues with the gut, any dysbiosis, um, if you don't have a, a good, um, strong gut barrier, some of those microbial components, along with whatever else you're eating and digesting, can seep into the systemic circulation. And these little barcodes of, of microbes and what else um, will switch on the inflammatory response at a systemic level. So I think that, you know, we do, uh, there's just a lot of discussion around gut health at the moment. And we do have growing evidence that the way that we live our lives, particularly in a sort of westernized culture, is not helping our gut have that integrity um, uh, and that comes down to maybe lack of uh, dietary fiber to feed and fertilize those gut microbes so they are producing things that can keep the barrier tight um, and also over consuming some of the other um, foods that are going to be uh, very unhelpful for that gut environment. Then you can move on to things like blood sugar regulation. So we know that poor blood sugar regulation can also contribute to inflammation. Um, and we can look at the, the statistics on things like metabolic disease, type 2 diabetes. So we know that that's a growing problem as well. Um, things like smoking um, or inactivity, um, body composition is a big one. So not necessarily body weight, but um, the sort of ratio of, of muscle mass and fat mass. So these are immunologically active organs. We have a lot of immune cells in our muscle and fat tissue. Um, we need the, the right amounts um, for our particular body. And we know things like obesity is a growing problem. So we're skewing the sort of ratio and that can lead to rising levels of inflammation. Um, also in infections can contribute if you have a, a chronic long-term infection. Um, yeah. And the list goes on, you know, wow. there's so many of these little things that we, <laughs> that we need to, I mean, Stephen, Stephen, I always say as well to exercise, <laughs> yep. you know, eat well, um, and, and get plenty of sleep. These seems to be the things yeah. that seem to always seem to mm. come back to the, the absolute basis of what we need. But if I was going to put you on the spot, Dr. Jenna, what are the three, foods that you think people should be consuming or should not be consuming, if you can actually give specific examples. Uh, I know that you mentioned before around blood sugar control, mm -hmm. and, and one of the things mm -hmm. that Steve and I are very, very um, much promoting, yes, high fiber is great, polyphenols mm -hmm. are unbelievable, we don't get enough in the diet anymore, um, but but the sugary foods, there, there seems to be, and I'm not even talking about the Franken foods out there, like the, the, the abominations in terms of chemicals that we consume every day. And I don't even think we really understand, you know, just how, I, I don't think we, we understand the impact totally at all. And, and especially the combination of some of these chemicals, mm. we have no idea. But if you were going to recommend maybe a couple of things just that come to the top of your mind and things of things where you've gone, wow, I'm avoiding that. Or you know what, I, I love incorporating this into my diet every week. Is there any any advice that you can give there? Uh, do you know what my top one would be? Um, would be extra virgin olive oil. Wow, yes. Um, 
and uh, I've just been uh, presenting on the Mediterranean diet, so it's really at the forefront yeah. of my mind. Right. Um, but uh, there is a, a whole bunch of we think of it as just a fat, and it's contributing uh, that that macro to our diet. Um, but actually, it brings with it so much more. It's more than just a, a fat. It's um, full of different phytochemicals, so these bioactive plant compounds, um, particular, particularly a set of phenols. Um, olecanthal is one of them, which has a structure really similar to ibuprofen, so the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Wow. And we know that it can downregulate the COX-2 enzymes. So the COX enzymes are producing prostaglandins and contributing to inflammation. So that's why we take ibuprofen when we have inflammation, or you may take it if that's prescribed to you. Um, and, and olive oil contains these phenols that are able to, to hit uh, uh, inhibits the COX enzymes to thereby reducing inflammation. And um, I just think there's a growing hypothesis that some of the reasons that the, the Mediterranean diet is associated with so many beneficial health outcomes is that it could Everybody in that area consumes olive oil as their go-to fat, um, and they're getting this constant low-grade anti-inflammatory uh, chemical delivered every day over long periods of time. So tapping down any unwanted inflammation. So I think that you know that olive oil. Um, one of my top ones. I think there's a lot, we need to sort of do a lot of education. People get a bit worried about cooking with it um, and things like smoke point, but actually we can dispel a lot of those myths and it is okay for all forms of normal home cooking. Smoke point is not a good indicator of um, uh, how an oil performs actually from the studies um, that we have more recently. So yeah, swap out your oils for olive oil. And, and are you saying there about in terms of cooking it, it becoming um, uh, uh, like free radical, like uh, d damaged trans, uh, trans fat, that sort of thing? Is that is that what it is, or, or what is it specifically Actually, around that? Um, yeah, so I think out of all the oils that were tested, I have to go back to. Mm. There's a particular study, <laughs> and I can send. Um, after we get off the, the call, um, where they compared it to things like canola oil and some of the other common oils that are used, you know, uh, different vegetable oils. Um, and olive oil outperformed all of them in terms of the sort of toxic byproducts that would be formed through the heat process um, and the stability because it contains all these phytochemicals that really stabilize the oil during the cooking process. It's, it's, it's a monounsaturated fat mm. and it's an omega-9. So any, any what I say to my students, any odd number oils, like three, um, five, seven and nine are the beneficial ones. Mm -hmm. And the sixes, we Australians and possibly people in England eat too much of. Yeah. So it's got a few big ticks, but you mm. mentioned those polyphenols. That's terrific. But it was interesting, that, that smoke point study, that, that sounds interesting. Yeah, it is. It is very yeah, that's interesting. That's great. Um, all right, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put... Get the reference. Yeah, I'll, no, that's I'll, good. I'll put you on the spot then in terms of, you know, what are some of the the horror food where you've looked at it and you've gone, wow, there is Don't not only that. no nutritional value, but there's this, this is potentially food. Well, food that you wouldn't eat or food, f f feed your family. Is there anything there that you want to point to? Do you know what I've really I've I've spent many years trying to dig up that definitive list of like foods I would eat, foods I wouldn't eat. And do you know what came out from years of research in this area was that um, it's the overall diet pattern that seems to count more and so moving towards a traditional diet pattern and we, we we speak about the mediterranean diet a lot because it has this huge the largest body of research but actually it's any um, minimally processed um diet pattern that involves sort of traditional cooking methods or, or, or organic local seasonal produce um and sort of eating in alignment with with um uh, other healthful behaviors like eating socially with friends, um, eating in a sort of um, similar times of day and having an active lifestyle. And so that really for me is, you know, you can then have a, a, a sliding scale of like more westernized diets and then more sort of 
mediterraneanized is one way to look at it but it could be any any kind of minimally processed diet and so i always try and slide everything along that scale towards the more minimally processed so that is thinking about yeah your seasonal local organic produce is grown in soil that's high quality that's that's cared for and not these monocrops um then also looking at the the seasonality of foods for example here in the uk we go into winter we get lots of these bright orange squashes and and bright orange colored vegetables rich in beta carotene that's exactly what we need going into that antiviral um immune defense uh you know winter bugs are going to be on the rise because they like the cooler climbs of um, uh, the, the colder months. So uh, then we have things like ginger and the warming spices that you might find around uh, in winter foods as well. And these actually are quite good at disrupting um, bacteria when they want to try and um, infect and colonize and stopping that, that growth pattern. So there's a lot of kind of intuition with like what's growing, what the season is, um, and sort of designing your pattern around that. And then you move into summer and you've got loads of like bright colored berries and and colored mm. colorful um fruits and vegetables salads lots of leafy greens you know packing in all those um antioxidants and we're going out in the sun more so we need to protect our skin more so our diet um we're stocking up on that as we go into winter where there may be period where some of these foods are less available so the whole pattern idea i really like because i think it it's, gives a structure for people and we have to translate that pattern to for people who live in a westernized world because we can't all retreat and and eat like our great great grandparents would have done um we have to sort of put it in the context of of how we we live and we live in a westernized country so it's quite it's a kind of challenge hmm. I, i'm so glad that you said that because i was speaking actually to some friends of mine the other day and we obviously always preach eat fresh, eat local wherever you possibly can. And they said, oh, but, you know, sometimes it's just so difficult. I can't find anything or I'm on the go. And I said, don't beat yourself up over it. So long as you yeah. you make your best efforts and you incorporate and you're mindful eating. I mean, we talk a lot about mindfulness at the moment. I think it sort of seems to be a bit on topic. But if you can mindfully, you know, look at your, your shopping habits, mindfully look at, at where you purchase things. Tony goes to online organic places yeah. that actually deliver straight to home. So she might top up down yeah. at the local, um, uh, you know, supermarket or, or grocery. In fact, we shop with the local store just around the corner. And most of the stuff is good, but it's not always, you know, it's not always fresh yeah. and organic sometimes. And uh, we try and yeah. avoid that as much as possible. But you, if you're going to be a Puritan, I think you're, you're, you're going to be a very special person. And I'm sure they're out there and good on you if you yeah. are. Yeah. But, uh, exactly. uh, you, you know, for the average, for the average person. Exactly. It's quite rigid, isn't it, to be really puritanical about it. If you have a job and kids and, and you know, various life things that, you know, come up, then it can actually be, be an additional stress to to try and, and have that perfect. Um, and so I think the pattern gives you that bit of wiggle room where things are not accessible, but it's what you do most of the time consistently that, that counts. Um, and so I think that's what really is coming out in the research. We just now need better ways to sort of assess and define diet patterns and, and help people have access to them. And I think of like education around, like, you know, you don't have to follow social norms just because everybody eats junk food doesn't mean that you have to follow that. And I'm really in favor of, you know, influencing the younger generation to create better social norms. Hmm. You know, like when my kids go to school and they're like, why don't we get to have crisps and, and all these things? And I'm like, it, because we just do it our own way. I'm not going to put my money, my buying power as a consumer into big food. You know, I have a choice uh, and I'm going to make that choice carefully. And I think people kind of just sleepwalk through life, you know, mm. and there, there's constant advertising that's um, thrown at them and, uh, and and these sort of social norms where it's like, oh, you don't even question it anymore because mm. it's just become so normal. My wife and I were talking about this. It's similar in the way, I guess, to we seem to be so much busier. We do have busier lifestyles. You know, both parents are working. The, the norms have all changed as well, too. Just like the iPad or the TV almost becomes the baby. Mm. It's like the packet of crisp and the packet food becomes the go-to yeah. food because we're busy. And I, and I guess unless you actually slow down and actually prepare, yeah. like Tony's a great, 
great uh, cook. So she bakes a lot of home tr- home sort of treats and things like that, where she's you know yeah. using low sugar, high fiber, high protein, good fats, and that sorts of things into the foods. And that's difficult. But now that Tony's into the habit of doing it, the the boys have actually got something that's better for them more often. Mm. Fruit, you know, that sort of stuff that's in season as well too. But again, a little bit of changing of your your process, and and it actually can become second nature. Yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. I think it's lovely. You know, it's not about never having those, um, like this the homemade snacks. Like, I, my mum was always making like cakes and biscuits, but cooking from scratch, you are less likely to include some of those um, ultra processed ingredients because they're they're only accessible at an industrial level. But also, you're you're passing on um, those skills to the children. And I think one of the barriers to eating a good diet is that you know you might lay all these amazing ingredients out in front of a person and they'll say but I don't know how to cook yeah, I don't know on. how to chop an onion I don't, you know so it's it's there's so many layers and we really have to make sure that the next generation do know how to cook they do know how to put pressure on big food systems to demand better um, for the planet for mm. for their plate mm. That's the, the, the one thing I wanted to just touch back on quickly as well too you did mention ginger before which I'm a mm. huge fan are there any um, uh, herbs and and look, even though we have a, a supplement arm to our, our business, we always say that supplements are always something that you add in for your diet or if you've got an acute uh, issue and things like that. Uh, Steve and I are massive fans of zinc. Yep. We, we kind of talk a little bit about the the, the hysteria, if you like, or the propaganda around vitamin C in colds that we, we feel that it's overdone. We feel that the amount that you need really is only, is it 150 milligrams a day, Steve? And anything more than that What's really? What's that zinc? Yeah, no, vitamin C. Oh yeah. You, you don't need too much of that. Um, I mean, uh, and again, I'm not sure what, what you believe. And, and again, gram. this was just what I think we did uh, some research showing that taking um, you know, lots of vitamin C reduce the the duration of the common cold by like a, a day matter. or so. No, yeah. no, no, Steve. I think it was hours. Oh, yeah, I think it, it was, was half a day or something. Yeah, it was as opposed to <laughs> zinc. Day, yeah. yeah, yeah. As opposed to zinc, um, uh, Steve. I, I honestly think if the research, if I remember correctly, it said that it reduced it by like an hour and a half yeah, or something. Some, it was crazy. It was measured in hours. Uh, but but I think mm. in terms of obviously zinc and and, yeah. and the benefits of zinc, because I talk to people all the time and and saying, you know, are you getting enough zinc? And they're like, why would I take zinc if I've, if I've got a cold? I need to reach for vitamin C. But yeah. is there any, I mean, yeah. you mentioned zin, uh, ginger before, um, you know, onion, um, you know, is there any Garlic. Garlic, of course, oh, garlic. Phew. I mean, is there anything there around foods and or supplementation of things like maybe echinacea or anything else that you've got opinions on around immunity? Yeah, you know what, when it comes to, you know, I mean, you guys are going into winter. Thanks for reminding us. Yeah, freezing. (laughs) (laughs) I'm so happy we're emerging from winter. It feels like the longest winter ever. But yeah, there are more circulating viruses in winter. They do prefer the cooler climes. We tend to huddle indoors more, so it's easier to, you know, transmit between us. Um, And yeah, the vitamin C is kind of the the classic immune boosting uh, vitamin, dare I say. But um, there's... It, to me, it's really outdated. I'm just mm. kind of like, oh, yawn. Um, and, I, you know, I, it might be something that I take if I came down with a really bad flu. I might add it into like my stack upon the first onset of symptoms. Um, but I don't think it's moving the needle a huge amount, it, you know, especially if you've got a pretty good diet and you're really nourishing yourself with some um, nice uh, foods that are going to make you um, feel better anyway when you get unwell. But I think zinc is a really good one. Again, if you've got your diet dialed in, I kind of like to think of it as, you know, you have to personalize your supplements for different things that life throw at you. So when you go into winter, there's a chance you're going to catch something if there's lots going around, especially if you've got kids in schools or commuting, that kind of thing. You want to have a little um, medicine box with things like vitamin C, zinc, um, uh, garlic, um, honey, lemon and ginger, uh, things like elderberry, medicinal mushrooms. Um, These are all really, really good things to have. If you want your vitamin C to work better, you want to take it with citrus bioflavonoids. These are really helping with um, how it's functioning. So, um, uh, you know, all the citrus fruits are kind of perfectly designed because they're going to combine vitamin C and the citrus bioflavonoids together. Um, 
uh, and things like zinc and taking that with quercetin, which is helping it get into where it needs to go in the body. Um, and so these are kind of things I would keep on hand for if you do fall sick. They might not be necessarily things you'd supplement with anyway, but then you might be using things like garlic, ginger, turmeric in your cooking, you know, throughout winter, making those kind of warming dishes. So you're getting um, those nutrients on a sort of regular basis anyway. Yeah, no, I love mm. it. Actually, sure. it's funny. We, it's a couple of times now where you're talking about, you know, eating fresh local what's in season, like with the squash and obviously the berries. And you just mm. mentioned there in terms of vitamin C and the bioflavonoids, we always come up with the saying that nature does know best. It really does. You know, and if we sort of follow those natural sorts of things that nature cycles. just seems to pre- prepare what it is that we need. The, 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 uh, I mean, I love the fact that you've got children. We always get a lot of questions around how to look after child health. What, what should we do? Um, you know, obviously they can be fussy at times. I mean, you've probably already mentioned it in terms of what you're cooking as far as my mum used to make a fantastic, when I was growing up, used, it's Scottish, born in Scotland, born in, 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 Fal- in Falkirk. I don't know if you know where that is. Uh, oh, yeah. My grandfather was from Glasgow growing up in New Zealand because they moved, they immigrated to New Zealand because yeah. I'm from New Zealand. And oh my goodness, I couldn't understand my grand father it was like it, 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 it was like you know did he have the cold shower after was that the same guy you were telling no that's that? my dad that's oh, your dad my, my, oh. da- my dad living in new zealand which is obviously oh, in christchurch freeze. canterbury he used to finish and this is gotta know he was he actually served in the second world war but but because he was 52 when he had me believe it or not but um he used to finish every single shower with a cold shower Every single shower. And, and in New Zealand, in the middle of winter, he, oh, my God, I would sit there and and, and he goes, oh, Jeff, you should do this for your immune system, funnily enough. Uh-huh. We're talking about this, right? Um, so we'll touch on that in a minute. Um, but in terms of my mum used to make this beautiful pumpkin soup and mm. she'd put ginger in it. And in Ooh, fact, sometimes yeah. the ginger, sometimes I remember she'd, she'd forget if she'd put the ginger and then she'd put it in again. Uh, and it's just been like, oh my gosh. But I've actually grown such a taste for ginger. I yeah. love ginger. In fact, I'll get ginger wherever I possibly can. Whenever I, I get a smoothie or anything, I ask for double ginger now mm. as well too, to, to the point where it's nearly burning my mouth off. But is there anything that you do, um, any foods that you cook or any sort of advice that you've got around helping children with, with you know, maybe – improving their immune system for protection and anything that you do potentially when they're not well? Yeah, because they're allergic to everything. Yeah, you know what? Kids, um, and I say this with a lot of compassion because I am a parent and it's really hard, but they, their immune systems are not fully developed when they're born. So a lot of the development takes place after birth, uh, but that represents a huge window of opportunity um, uh, for us to intervene and make sure we get it on the right trajectory. And when we look at the, the stats on allergies, we can see that something's gone awry in those early years that is not sending kids down the right path that we want in terms of their immune development. Um, And there's a few kind of uh, elements to what might be going on. Um, So they're born with a a immature uh, immune system, but also they're kind of a blank canvas. Um, And then after birth, they're being colonized by microbes they've inherited from the mother, from the environment, um, from things like um, uh, breast milk, and those microbes are taking up um, shop in their guts, setting up a little ecosystem and training and educating the immune system. So we have around 70 percent of our immune system located along the digestive tract. Uh, and so these microbes are the key trainers and educators. And a lot of that's taking place in the first two to three years. So it's really, really um, sort of crucial early years where this is happening. And what we've seen is that uh, the, the switch from uh, vaginal birth to C-sections, uh, oh, yeah. I sort of read a statistic the other day that we now have more <laughs> C-sections than vaginal births in some countries. Wow. And most of that is sort of either, either the mother's being recommended that medically for a good reason or just as, as an option or pay, mothers are opting for that if it's available to them and there's you know lots of valid reasons why someone might have a c-section that may, might save their life the child's life um but we didn't know before the impact that had to this microbial colonization. and now that we're aware of it i think we really need to develop tools so that we can support 
babies in getting somehow uh, some of the dose of microbes they'd normally get when they go down the birth canal um, because this really starts that ecosystem inside the child that's going to then impact the immune system. The next thing that comes along is, is the feeding of the child and Breast milk, we now know, contains these particular um, carbohydrate structures, which for a long time, they couldn't work out why they were there because they didn't seem to be nutritionally important for the baby, but actually they're fertilizer for the microbes in the gut. So there are these particular um, um, carbohydrates in, in the breast milk. And so that's not um, or wasn't well replicated in formula which means that babies who were getting formula were missing out on these important um, um, carbohydrates. What are the um, carbohydrates structure. called, Dr. Jenna? Do you know what the name oh, of them is? I'm tired now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's light there, isn't it? <laughs> can you really hear? I mean, I'm putting you on the spot. I mean, this is probably research you've done a while ago, but if you can remember the name. Yeah, it, yeah it's in my books. I just, okay, um, that's all right. Maybe, well, maybe well, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll look it up because I'm very, very interested and in I've actually got friends of mine that are that are making baby formula. And look, I, we agree as well too, breast is best. Uh, and, and the thing yeah. I was going to mention, and I'm not an expert on this field at all, Steve would know more than I would, but was colostrum. And, and obviously we knew that the importance of the for the immune system, protein, typically yeah. the milk that comes out right at the very beginning the first one is is, is often quite yeah. clear and, and that's and that's got so much nutrients and so much yeah. benefits and and look we don't want to make any mums that have had a c-section or that can't breastfeed yeah. feel mm. bad and this is not about this at all but it's yeah. about being aware like my son um, started to come at 23 weeks so he mm. was Tony was sewn up literally and she was pumped full of steroids and and of course that saved Corbin's life my yeah, son's life yeah, of course. but he came out with the most terrible eczema so we and now he's got none right so we, yeah, we overcame that through yeah. nutrition and, and health and all the rest of it so this is not about saying feel bad if this has happened but mm. if you're aware of it yeah. then you yeah. can take steps to recolonize the gut in your in, in your in your in your yeah. young child or your baby so yeah is there anything you'd recommend I mean I know they looked at at different compounds to give to give to children like postbiotics prebiotics mm. um you know um uh, that sort of thing so bifidum bacterium infantilis was the yep. classic one we used to give as naturopaths in the olden days and um you know there's lots of carbohydrates in breast milk well, one of them's lactic um you know lactic acid that that sort of um ingredients that 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 are very good for babies but 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 you're right i mean it, it, th these days i mean my nephew's five and um well, I was talking with my brother-in-law about school and that, and I said, oh, yeah, I got sent to school with a peanut butter sandwich, and, and, and he sort of went, oh, God, you can't do that anymore because you'll kill someone. And I went, what are you talking about? I don't have kids. And it's like, oh, no, peanuts are you're not allowed to take them to school at all. Yeah. And it's like that was my staple as a kid. You know, I grew up as a single parent. You know, we weren't that wealthy, and peanut butter sandwiches was what I ate. And yeah. now now I know that kills people. So I went, oh, that's a bit interesting. Well, it's it's a, it's funny, actually, with regards to children. I mean, not only are allergies on the rise, like yeah. over the top, but ADHD, the rise of ADHD yeah. is, is through the roof as well too. And, and look, there's a lot of things that are controversial that are being put forward. There's, I think there's a lot of correlation, whether it's causation I'm not sure. I've got my own opinions. They're probably too controversial to mention. Yeah. Um, I'll get locked up. But um, in terms of, um, uh, you know, is there any advice that you'd want to give to parents, uh, Dr. Jenner, who maybe did have C-section um, or, or maybe couldn't breastfeed or breastfeed for a very short period of time, yeah. things that you, you would recommend? Exactly. I think what you mentioned earlier is really important because we need to have these conversations, but we're not having these conversations to make um, parents feel bad about maybe decisions they've made or had to make based on their circumstances. My twin's also premature and that's a whole, you know, um, unique experience uh, that presents lots of challenges, uh, you know, across uh, the birth, the feeding, everything in early life. And um, so, yeah, always speaking with compassion, but I think it is, um, if you're pregnant, looking at for resources around this so that you can be informed, talking to your healthcare provider. There are certain trials going on about um, what we call vaginal seeding. So trying to mm -hmm. transfer some of the microbes from the birth canal to the baby um, once the baby's out um, to try and seed it with the right microbes. Mm -hmm. um, so the, this is kind of very early days in the research. Um, there's also been a lot of improvements in formula 
production. I don't know the status in, in Australia, but I know there are companies across the globe that are trying to emulate some of these. Um, oh, human milk oligosaccharides. I've just remembered. Ah, yeah. Them. The oligosaccharides, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so these human milk oligosaccharides, which are the, the fertilizer for the microbiome. So now that we know this information, then obviously they've started to try and emulate that in formula. Wow. So you may be right. able to access uh, a formula that, that has that inside. And then you know that you're you're at least delivering some of that um, element of breast milk that we now have linked to sort of downstream immune health. Mm -hmm. um, and then once they're on to, to solid food, it's, it's really um, a about access to um, the good microbes. And we don't just get that from our food, we get it from our environment. Hmm. So we're breathing our biome all the time. You know, we're exchanging microbes with each other, with pets, um, with the spaces that we go to. There's a really lovely um, Scandinavian study where they enriched um, the daycare so that the the children had much more access to green space, digging in the dirt, playing right. in sand, playing in, in grass and everything. And they looked in empirically by taking measurements of their immune system and, and looking at the development over, uh, I'd have to check how long the study went on for, probably 12 months or longer. Uh, and they saw improvements in the immune system in, in, across various parameters uh, just by enriching their access to nature and mm. being outdoors. And so this to me is really something fundamental that all parents can perhaps easily, freely and accessibly do is, you know, get your kid out in nature, mm. get them, you know, digging in the dirt, Getting playing dirty. in the grass, uh, mm -hmm. being around trees, um, uh, being around animals and, and the hygiene importance uh, part is important. So coming back to uh, your home, washing hands before eating food, but allowing them to get dirty. You know, we now we now know that this is really, really crucial. So um, don't be afraid. We probably got a bit crazy with COVID and sterilizing everything. And uh, so hopefully that not too much damage has been done there and people can kind of start to relax more and, and think about about these good germs they're they're populating our gut and helping educate the immune system and this is really important not just for us as adults but particularly in childhood well it's mm. it's really great point that you brought up and i remember many years ago i saw a study out of the uk showing specifically around the hygiene hypothesis where they were using 99.9 percent .9 bacterial sprays and wipes everywhere mm. and children were becoming sicker because yeah. you're absolutely right it was killing off absolutely everything and it's funny because i mentioned this to somebody the other day about um mouthwash i said don't use mouthwash and they're like what i use it all the time i'm like oh my <laughs> yeah. my, my friend you are killing off all of the good stuff in yeah. not just the bad but the good as well too so yeah. you know have you got any have you got any thoughts on on oral health as far as your immune systems is concerned is there anything you do recommend oh. Yeah, massive, because we now know that the oral microbiome is sort of seeding the gut microbiome. So what's happening in your mouth is kind of upstream of, of how happy your gut is. Um, and actually, I, I did a project uh with a dentist last year, and um, uh, and it's really interesting. If you look in the dental literature, um, there's actually studies where if you have an autoimmune disease, for example, so say you have rheumatoid arthritis or some kind of chronic inflammatory disease, but you go and see your dental hygienist regularly, you have um, very meticulous care of your oral cavity. So obviously avoiding all those horrible mouthwashes, but regular flossing and brushing mm. um, and everything, you can improve symptoms. And when you let your dental hygiene go a little bit, and your gums start to get a bit irritated, bleeding gums, that kind of thing, that precedes a, a flare of the autoimmune condition. I think because this, yeah, go on, sorry. I was gonna say that the, then you get a overrun of these sort of less favorable bacteria, but the gums get very leaky and permeable and the microbes can seep into the, the body and then they end up around different parts. And if you have something like rheumatoid arthritis, you, you get suddenly the joints get triggered again because you've got these bits of microbes and mm. getting into the joints when they shouldn't be. I, I know that they, there was a very, very strong link with, between, and again, Steve, yeah. you correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, gingivitis, 
and heart disease. Yeah, very much. Um, in, and, in the hospitals. Yeah. Yes. And, they, and I think yeah, this, any cardiovascular patient gets a dental check. It's great, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's I nice it's like, that they're wow. finally starting to put this these is, things together. Yeah, my right? wife's like, a nurse and she she has to put people in with the dentist. Wow, that's great. When she's in cardiology, it's like they all get it. Yeah, they probably use bloody <laughs> mouthwash. Oh, but anyway. They, they use chlorhexidine. Oh, my it's a terrible yeah. anti- Oh, it's shocking. The interesting thing that we found when we were doing the study is that when you talk to like a rheumatologist who's taking care of uh, someone with rheumatoid arthritis, they have never looked at this dental literature because it's in the dental journals. Yeah. It's not in the rheumatology journals. And so, uh, uh, if you know, it wouldn't cross their mind to tell that patient to go and get regular dental checks to stop the mouthwash, to make sure they're flossing and, and all of those things. So we need the real kind of cross-pollination of different areas, different disciplines to be taking place. So I think that, you know, if you do have problems with your oral health, that's a kind of warning sign that there's other stuff in the body that's not good. And like you say, the link with heart disease has now become quite well established. Yeah. Um, so it's it's a it's a kind of metric because we can all you know get a feel for what our mouth is doing on a daily basis. So it's a kind of barometer um, for the other things that might be less easy to test for. And this is the thing I like about uh, naturopaths mm. and and uh, nutritionists and and things like that. Often they look at things holistically. Yourself and Elisma, who are both naturopaths, Elisma is mm. one of our other uh, co-contributors here. Um, uh, it's almost like building a freeway, and then and then. And then not worrying about the off ramps. Yeah. It's like it's yeah, like you're missing it, the, 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 these things are connected. They have a flow on effect. And if you're not looking at everything and how it works, I mean, we do it with our roads. Why don't we do it with our, our body? But it's, um, it's funny. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, what, there's a saying. Talk to Jeffrey Bland, who's quite a famous nutritionist. Yeah. Uh, you may have heard of him. Um, you know, he, he, I went to one of his lectures about 20 years ago, and he said specialists, and this is not a cast on yourself or anything. It's totally different. But specialists know more and more about less, less and less, less till they know absolutely everything about, about nothing. nothing. <laughs> you know, and it's sort of like, it's you, you have to think about that for a second. My initial thought was, no, I disagree yeah. with that. Specialists must look at all aspects. And, and you're right, you know, the, the rheumatologist wouldn't check the teeth. You know, they, they wouldn't, you know, with my disease, it was, it was a gut microbiome called Klebsiella, which triggered my ankylosing spondylitis. It wasn't even discussed. And I was in hospital for six weeks for this thing. And, you know, how's your, how's your gut? Well, I don't know. You know, it's like there wasn't a stool test done or anything. And I think the literature is pretty clear on this now. So it's, it's, you're absolutely right. And I, I know we've got limited time with you, but but I really wanted to talk to you about stress and mental health and the immune system. You know, we know that chronic inflammation takes serotonin down this kind of urine pathway, which depletes serotonin out of our brain. I'd love you to talk a bit about mental health and the immune system, which again, sounds like they're both different specialities, but I'd love if you'd yeah. share your thoughts on that, you know, it, uh, just the link exactly. between them. And I think, you know, the brain and the immune system are both sensing systems. They have to be working together mm. because, you know, your brain is there um, taking in information from your senses saying, oh, we're, we're, you know, we're about to be hit by a car or, you know, that person over there looks like they're going to sneeze on us and they, you know, they're sniveling. And, and Lock that up. information is then communicated to... Um, to the immune system so it can prepare itself and be ready. You know, you're not going to have your immune system turned on all the time because it's energetically very costly. So you, you want to keep it um, quiescent. And then when there is a risk, then it's got to be prepared. So, you know, when we are stepping off the pavement uh, and didn't realize that we're about to be hit by a car, um, we get a sudden burst of the stress chemistry and you have that um, cortisol and adrenaline and that's going to prime your immune system because there might be an injury, you might need some repair, there might be uh, a, you know, a graze, an infection, something like that. Um, and so that's how it's meant to work. And that's in the short term, it's supposed to save us. But sadly, you know, most people uh, are feel stressed more frequently than they should. Um, uh, there's more things triggering stress than perhaps evolutionary, uh, the system was designed to cope with. And so what we find is that we have a real kind of, um, it's like, you know, pressing the accelerator and the brake at the same time and the, the whole kind of system's confused. And, and you know, if you've ever had to take a, a sort of hydrocortisone cream for a, a skin rash, you'll know how powerful it is at removing inflammation. And cortisol, our own stress hormone, is pretty good at removing the immune system. It's actually 
directly down-regulating the immune system because most of our immune cells have receptors on their surface for cortisol. So um, that's fine in, in some settings, but when it's on the sort of long term, it's going to cause problems and you just feel run down, you're more susceptible to things. It also kind of skews the balance of the different types of immune cells down more of the allergic pathway. So that can trigger flares of things like allergies, um, things like autoimmune diseases. So in terms then, stress is a huge one. I mean, I think I think the research, Steve, is all showing that more and more of us are becoming mm. stressed out, dealing with stress and then stress-related issues as well too, not just mental health but, but other things. But in terms of advice as far as what you'd give to, you know, people out there that are listening to this, uh, of course it's easy to say, well, stress less, right? Chill out, <laughs> go sunbathe. Yeah, that's very, yeah. very, I mean, that's, I mean, great. You've got a high stress job. You've got you've got children. You've got bills to pay. You're concerned. But what are some of the practical things that that you do personally, or that you recommend to to your clients that they can practical things that they can do to help um, offset or, or alleviate some of the stress, uh, either responses or even reduce stress it's, itself entirely. Yeah, I mean, I think like awareness is really important. So you know, we we kind of live in a kind of high stress state, then that becomes our baseline. Uh, and we're probably not even aware that we're kind of constantly in this um, uh, mindset. Um, so bringing that awareness piece, and then I kind of divide it into sort of three different things. So I think the really um, the, you know, immediate things that we can do when we get, uh, we have, we're in work and we have a terrible meeting or a stressful situation at home or something else happens, then there's certain things that we can have control over, which is our breathing. So we can take control over our own breath um, Mm -hmm. uh, and and take some long inhales and exhales. Um, That is sending a signal to the body that you're calm because when your breathing is long and slow and relaxed, um, it's, it's neurologically telling your brain that this is a safe, calm situation. When we're stressed, we tend to have much shallower breathing. So by kind of overriding the stress and, and saying that we're taking control of the breath, that is something that is quite useful. Um, also, you know, we spend a lot of time staring at screens or in a narrow focus, whereas when we're relaxed, we might be taking in the whole view, you That's know, our, our eye sockets, everything sort of relaxes. And again, that sends a signal to the brain that it's safe. You know, we're, we're sitting back, we're just enjoying the vista. Um, it's all very nice. And so those are two things we can do in the moment. And then I think with the other thing we have to think about is stress proofing ourself because um, inevitable, like there's going to be inevitable stresses that come along. I think I'm a bit of a stressed head myself. So I've been on my own kind of personal journey to to navigate this. Um, And then I think it's about furnishing your own toolbox with tools that work for you. So I love physical activity. I like just the flow of going for a walk or going for a run. Uh, I also like a really focused session in the gym where I'm just with the music's on, drown everything out. It's just about putting yourself through this physical uh, experience but it kind of gets me out of my own head. So, you know, and if I hadn't gone and done that workout, I would probably just sit there with the wheels turning, over worrying about some situation. Uh, and so just forcing yourself to have those habits where you do those activities that gets you out your own head, helps you untangle your thoughts. For some people that might be just talking with a friend, um, writing it down, journaling, you know, everyone has a kind of thing that they would lean into more. Yeah. Um, Meditation is a great one because we know the stacks of, of research on how this is um, a, a really good practice to counter the negative effects of stress. I do think it's not for everyone. I do think that meditation can sometimes be stressful if you feel like you don't know how to do it, you don't know where to start. It's one of those things where I think it needs a bit of investment and time and getting educated and trained in it. Um, uh, and then mindfulness is just something you can sprinkle through through your day and that's this sort of pause and awareness the minute you have awareness you have an opportunity to have a little bit of control and not let yourself get like sucked into to a stressful situation yeah and then there's the final hermetic stressors so for me this is like 
you know, I live by the beach um, uh, and right now the sea is very cold, uh, but there's a, a lot of opportunities to just jump in and a few minutes in a freezing cold sea <laughs> is a really good way to help you feel like more resilient to anything the world's going to throw at you. So that kind of hormetic effect, you know, where you have a, you're deliberately putting yourself into a stressful situation uh-huh. to build your resilience yeah. to mm-hmm. the chemistry in the body and i think that's it isn't it i mean you go to gym to to get resistance which is stressing the muscle so that it actually becomes yes. more yeah. resilient stronger and able to cope with things um i'll come back onto that that cold shower that cold jump in a minute because steve and i are actually doing a whole podcast on this um yeah. it's, okay. it's i guess it's phenomenon is too strong a word because it's been around for a long time and, and we know some of the benefits but it's funny because i'll go and see my Cairo or my my massage therapist and he goes oh You've been you've been stressed out lately because like, and I said why and he goes because you haven't been breathing properly is you're taking short shallow breaths you're not breathing in yeah. and, and, and he, he, we can see it you can feel it my neck goes out my everything feels horrible well, I just got back yeah. from from uh, a week's holiday down on the um the the not the Gold Coast but go past the Gold Coast down to Coolangatta where the, it was just beautiful surf we, we're we're sort of coming out of summer so the temperature's lovely lying on the beach under a cabana and just you could almost feel the stress and the and the the release and everything. And I was listening to Huberman, Dr. Huberman. I'm not, not sure if you know him, but he's a brilliant guy. Um, and he was talking about, uh, and I've heard this many times before as well too. Just just if you're in the office, if you can go outside where you can see the horizon, go into a park if you can during your lunch break. If you can, maybe even go up into the top of your building if you can get access to there and just spend five minutes if you can. Hopefully, if it's sunny in the sunshine, looking out into the distance. Um, it, it, there's definitely a, a, a physiological um, impact of stop being nearsighted all the time and sort of in closed areas with fluoro lights, getting out into nature, taking some deep yeah. breaths, F- even just five minutes in your day can make such a big impact just to sort of de-stressing yeah. a little bit. So that that's, that's great. So in terms of your, your cold water therapy, um, I'll just come back to this quickly while we've got a little bit of time left. Um, have you, have you looked much into that in terms of um, improving immunity? Is there any research or science that you can share there? Yeah, there. I mean, there's some lovely studies showing that you know um, habitual cold, cold plungers, cold water swimmers um, have less days off sick from, from work. They um, have reduced frequencies of you know colds and flus, um, uh, and so there's a lot of um, evidence. But I guess we always have to consider that the people who do these practices might be more health conscious generally. You know, if you're a cold water swimmer, you're also getting physical activity. Mm. Where where I am here in the UK, in Brighton, there is huge communities of people who meet on the beach. So you've got that social aspect mm. as well. So I think there's a like kind of healthy user effect as well. Um, but I do think that there is undeniable um, benefits to the cold um, at the cellular level, you know, in terms of things like the um, uh, the, the brown fat so the energy um, consumption, the mitochondrial health, that side of it too. We know that it can induce what, what we call cold shock proteins. So these are kind of proteins that are going to help and um, protect our cells when we're in extreme cold temperatures. So our body's producing these to go, okay, the, if we stay in the cold too long, we might get some damage. So we have to protect ourselves because they, they like to be at a certain temperature. When these are sort of helpful to sort of really reinforce um, uh, and make uh, make everything more robust. Similar to what happens in a sauna where you have the heat shock proteins, which are being induced when you have exposure to, to heat. So it's that real kind of balance of... Um, uh, you know, you can stack the two together if you like. I love sauna. I just built a sauna in my garden because I oh. loved it so much. Um, like a, sw- again, a Swedish or an infrared or? Uh, yeah, traditional. I yeah. went down the traditional. Oh, yeah. the yeah. theme on the... Yeah, there's oh. more evidence. And I kind of like the ritual as well. But yeah. that was kind of um, the the big the big pillar on dealing with me being a bit of a stress head is sort of a, a sauna ritual kind of really helps swing the dial. Um, but yeah, these are kind of the lovely add-ons, I think. You know, once you've nailed the basics, the sleep, the stress, the food, the, the gut health, um, uh, you know, the physical activity, then, you know, you're going to pepper on top the really nice 
um, extras. Yeah. yeah. Um, like getting a, a, a hot or cold ritual, that kind of thing, um, taking things to the next level. But it's only once you've got the foundations, I think, that then people need to go and, and build. Before we run out of time, yeah. I, I wanted to ask, what is your opinion on fasting, either intermittent or, or even sort of, you know, periods of fast? Is, is, do, do you have any, any sort of research or information that that could support a, a healthy immune system? Yeah, I mean, from the studies that have been done specifically on the immune system, we're quite limited in what we can probably translate. Um, but we know that certain periods of fasting, probably beyond 72 hours, it's going to be maybe different from individual to individual. Um, you, it, is, it is a stress on the body. So you are getting a large release of things like cortisol. But this has been shown to get rid of any immune cells that are kind of old, tired, not so useful anymore. Um, and so when you clear those out, you you only have so much what we call immunological space in the body. So your body's not going to pump in more immune cells because it can already detect how many you have in circulation. Oh, wow. So it's got this really cool method uh, of keeping a kind of homeostasis there. Um, and things change when you get infections and then it will go back to the, the baseline. But if you have a huge clear out of immune cells because you've done this fast and, and it's caused the, the clearing out of old tired immune cells, then you're going to produce some fresh new ones. So just like anything, the new ones are probably going to be more effective, work better, that kind of thing. Wow. So there's this kind of interesting data in animals, and this is really useful for um, uh, particularly people who are undergoing chemotherapy. It can be uh, useful and um, also autoimmune disease. Um, but in terms of translating that to outside of a kind of experimental setting, where you're, you know, in a study that's exploring a specific hypothesis. I don't think we yet have a protocol that we can say this is the ideal, um, the ideal uh, window for the general population. So I think it will vary from individual to individual. I think we need to go by how we feel. I feel better when I'm not snacking all day. And I think we have a snacking problem. Mm. You know, we graze for up to 18 hours a day. Um, that's what sort of mo most of the latest studies show. When you eat, you get into the postprandial state. That's a more inflammatory state mm. because that's when your gut is a bit more permeable because it's absorbing nutrients and stuff. So there you have that low-grade inflammation link again. So if you're eating all the time, you're more likely to increase that low-grade inflammation. Mm. Whereas if you're kind of having these designed meals that include all the right components and keep you satiated until your next meal, um, then you have a, a period in a fed state and a period in a fasted state. And then the actual fasting window, I think you can play around with it. I don't think people can jump into doing 24-hour fast if they've never even tried to wait till their next meal before eating um and so i think it's in certain phases of life it might not be appropriate as well and you've just got to make sure that you're getting your your macros and and your micronutrients in in the, the eating window that you've chosen as well so it, it can be quite useful in creating a calorie deficit and helping people manage weight but i think the other kind of more fancy things we're going to have to wait and see a little bit longer. Have you just lastly on that? Have you have you seen the the sixteen eight sort of fast that's becoming very popular at the moment? Where you're only eating in an eight hour sort of window. Um, so so typically yeah. people stop eating at you know seven eight o'clock at night and then not picking up food again until sort of midday the next day. Um, is, have you seen anything on that around helping the immune system? Uh, not specifically on the immune system, but I think that one's quite a nice one for people to aim for mm. if they're curious in trying fasting because it's not um, like a 24 hour fast can be quite maybe difficult with work or or social activities but that's um, more feasible more practical maybe mm. that's personally what I lean towards although I'm more of a breakfast person because I'm an early riser so <laughs> yeah. big English breakfast I, oh, I did a, I bacon did, eggs I did a three day fast one time and oh. I've got to say that that was that was tough that was oh, I haven't, that I haven't was done tough. that since yeah. the drop of the yeah, days that but, was but very interesting but look Dr. Dr. Janet, we're very mindful of your time. We mm. really appreciate you oh. for staying up well past your bedtime. Um, it's been fascinating <laughs> it's talking bedtime. with you. Could you please let everybody know if they're interested in your books, your information, your website, how they can get in contact with you, podcasts, anything that you're doing. Instagram. Do you want to just, yeah, just let us know where they can where they can see you, where they can find you. Sure. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm most active on Instagram because there's, you know, only so much hours in the day for social media. So they can find me, search my name, doctor. So it's dr underscore Jenna underscore Machoki, which is M A C C I O C H I. Um, my website's just drjennamachoki.com. I'm sometimes popping up on Twitter and TikTok, depending on how I feel. But um, yeah, reach out, get in touch. My email address and everything's on my website. I love to hear from people. Um, always got lots of new, exciting projects, cooking. So um, I, I love to to collaborate and and you know get to know other people in the space. So do get in touch. Brilliant, brilliant. Terrific. And look, we'll put the details in the links below yep. as well too. And look, again, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. It's late there as no well too. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jenna. And um, hopefully we'll see you again. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, guys. All right. Take thank you, Jenna. Bye Thank now. you. Bye.